Amen. Amen. I want you to, if you would, open your Bibles with me to uh, the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. That's when we're going to continue on in this mini-series today of the Kingdom Agenda. But before I get there, I'm going to read the foundational scripture for our theme in 2019. And that theme is setting things in order. Hebrews 11 and 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, the world, the universe, the seen and the unseen universe, they were framed, set in order, they were orderly arranged by the word of God. Amen? God is a God of order. He is a God of order. Now, in our study on last week, we did part two of the kingdom agenda. And in that message, we took a look at how the kingdom of God is of great necessity. And uh, because there's another kingdom that has been set up to rival and to oppose God's kingdom. And we saw in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the 14th chapter, how Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God, the angel who was powerful and beautiful, the worship leader in the heavens, how he led a rebellion against God. We also stated that Satan's kingdom is marked by rebellion. And we looked at the five eye wheels of Lucifer in Isaiah 14 and how he spoke of how he is. He would ascend into the heavens and he would raise his throne above the stars of God. And he would sit on the mount of the assembly. He would ascend above the heights of the clouds and he would make himself like the most high. Satan and his kingdom are diametrically opposed to the agenda of God. He is the God of this world, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. We also shared information on an article that I shared with us on last week entitled The Gay Agenda Blueprint, A Plan to Transform America. Uh, in the 13th chapter of Matthew, the 33rd verse, we saw how Jesus compared the kingdom of God to leaven or yeast that a woman purposely took and hid three measures in some dough and how it penetrated and then it permeated the entire lump. And we stated that God's kingdom agenda is like that leaven when the church was born and believers entered the kingdom of God through the new birth. The kingdom has not only grown, but through the spreading of the gospel and the influence of the king, the kingdom is being advanced. And today we're going to do part three of the kingdom agenda. And let me read verse 33 again of Romans, I mean uh, Matthew's gospel chapter 33. Verse number 33, again, another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened till it was all leavened. Now, now that we see that, that Satan has a plan, uh, that he has an agenda for this nation, and he is actively in, implementing his plan in the culture through the gay agenda in Hollywood and through politics and other means, it's important now that we take a look at how his kingdom is set up. Now let me just say this real quickly because the kingdom agenda of Satan, his kingdom agenda is not just, is not just the gay agenda. That's just one part of it. Can you say amen? And I want you all to pay particular attention to me when I get to some uh, some other parts of his agenda on today because I want you all to understand, you know, Satan, Satan is the God of this world. And as I read on last week, he has the whole world 
whole world of unbelievers in his sway, <clears throat> under his influence. Yes. And we're living in critical times. We're living in critical times where people are agreeing with what is wrong and making it right. Yeah. Yeah. And disagreeing with what is right and trying to make it wrong. And as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as kingdom citizens, you and I have to, we have to align ourselves with the kingdom agenda Amen. and not go with the, with the sway, not, not get caught up in the cultural and the emotional experiences that are out in the world. And stay with the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing I want to say about Satan's kingdom is that his kingdom is spiritual. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 6. Satan's kingdom is spiritual. Yes, the second characteristic of his kingdom is that it's spiritual. Just as God's kingdom is spiritual, Satan's kingdom is spiritual. So it shouldn't surprise us that these two kingdoms clash in the spiritual realm. Uh, you don't have to be a Christian for long uh, to learn that the Christian life is a battleground and not a playground. And the reason this is true is that we are in conflict with a spiritual foe. Uh, Paul gives us the classic description here in Ephesians chapter number 6. I'm, I'm going to read verses 10 through 12. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness uh, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, listen to this, in the heavenly places. Spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The real enemy that you and I fight against, that we battle against, is not flesh and blood people. And I know sometimes, you know, people act like they are Satan personified. Can I get an amen? Satan in the flesh. But they are not the real enemy. They are vehicles that Satan works through to carry out his agenda. Remember, spirits need physical bodies to operate in and through or they're functioning illegally on the earth. So unless you're living on God's kingdom agenda, getting mad at other people won't solve your problem. I have to remind myself of that so often. All Satan has to do is to find the right person and you get all messed up again. Can I get an amen today? And that's why it's just... You know, just getting a, a new wife or getting a new husband won't necessarily solve your problem. <laughs> if Satan gets hold of your new spouse, you're going to react in the same way that you did with the old spouse and move on to somebody else. And we have to understand that the real problem is spiritual because that's the realm that Satan operates in. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the physical realm is not real or that people or circumstances controlled by Satan shouldn't be dealt with. It's just addressing these things will only work if you're also addressing the cause behind the problem. Always remember that. It's not the people, but it's the person behind the people. And that's the enemy, Satan. Satan will use people. And I want to be honest with you today, he doesn't care who he uses. Anyone who will make themselves available to him, he will use them. Can I get an amen? amen. Anyone that make themselves available, devil will use them. Now, 
let's keep going here because we can't be strong in our own power to fight Satan. The Bible never tells us to be strong. Paul said, be strong in the Lord. And we need that because Satan has all manner of evil spiritual forces lined up against us. And this is why it's absolutely crucial that we live in the spirit by prioritizing spiritual, the spiritual aspect of life. Uh, if we're going to experience victory in all aspects of our lives. That's why Paul talked about over in chapter 5 verse 18, be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. Can I get an amen? And over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he talked about walking in the Spirit so that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't just be spiritual on Sunday for a couple of hours and go out there and expect to walk victorious and deal with the devil and, and win all the time. Can I get an amen? No. No, you have to walk in the spirit daily. Can I get an amen today? You got to walk in the spirit daily. That means every day, man. I need to ask the Lord to fill me with your spirit. <laughs> Help me to walk in the spirit today because if you don't, I'm going to get in the flesh and I may get myself and somebody else in trouble. Because my flesh is not saved. And that's where the enemy wants to deal with you. He wants to bring you into an area where he can defeat you. And that's in your flesh. Yeah. 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 Let me give you an example of something. Yesterday I was watching, I was watching ESPN. Now this, some of y'all may be able to relate to this. I hope you can. And I like to watch all these old fights. They were showing some old fights. Floyd Mayweather. You know, showed when he was fighting uh, Manny Pacquiao and a couple of other other highlights. One, and I told y'all this before. I told y'all about Floyd Mayweather. He retired 15-0. Never lost a fight. Never lost a fight. A lot of people say Floyd Mayweather. You know, ah, he too boring. You know, I like to see people just beat folk up, just beat them down, pow, just pull, knock them out. You know, people like them kind of fights. You know, that's you know, that's, that's warriors and, 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 you know, that's, you know, uh, mano on mano, just beating each other, have that, all right? But Floyd Mayweather practices the art and the science of boxing. Hit and don't get hit. His uncle, what's his uncle name? Was it Richard? No, his uncle that trained him. His uncle trained him. Is a perfect example of someone who got hit too many times. His uncle that trained him. He has brain damage now because he got hit too many times. Many boxers you see have that problem. They got hit too many times. What did Floyd Mayweather do? All Floyd Mayweather does is he practices the same principle every time. He's sticky, pop, roll his shoulder so you can't hit him. And if you get too close to him, you grab him. Can I get an amen? amen? And then he'll push you off for you, and then pop you again, pop, pop. And, and then he and roll the shoulder so you can't hit master defense. Can you say amen? amen? Hard to hit Floyd. Hard to hit good punches on. So he retired 50 and 0. 50 and 0. You can say what you want to say, but hey, you know, I don't know too many fighters that retired undefeated. Rocky Marciano was the only other one that I know of. Can you say amen? amen? But what was his secret? He practiced the same principles every time. In other words, what Floyd Mayweather would do, he would not allow other fighters to bring him into their realm. Right. Right. <laughs> I get an amen. amen. He brought them into his realm. Amen. And my point is this. You got to walk in the spirit so that the devil does not bring you into the flesh because that is where he will defeat you every single time. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I get an amen today? Walk in the spirit. Now let's talk about this here because um, Paul talked about the heavenly realm. These forces in the heavenly 
places. <coughs> Ephesians 6 and 12. Now this expression is used several times in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1 verse 3. Chapter 2 verse 6. And chapter 3 verse 10. And the phrase heavenly places does not refer to the heavens. It describes a sphere of of authority where God and Satan do battle for the allegiance and the obedience of a people and where spiritual decisions are made. And there's a lot happening in this realm. So if you don't know how to function in the heavenly places, you're going to be messed up in your earthly places. And probably the best way to illustrate this is to think about Washington, D.C. and Capitol Hill where the laws that govern our nation are being written. There are two, two warring factions on the Hill, the Democrats and the Republicans. The two parties have different philosophies and different agendas and each side want uh, to win each issue. So the laws that are passed to govern us are often based on the party, on which party wins the day on Capitol Hill. So something similar happens in the heavenly places. God and Satan are at war to see who will establish the rules that govern the earth. And the nature of Satan's kingdom makes it imperative that we learn to think spiritually. Why? Because if you're not thinking spiritually, you won't be in tune with what is happening in the heavenly realms. You won't recognize Satan's agenda when you see it, so you won't be able to say, no, not, not here. No, you can't do that up in here. Let me give you an example of something. A lot of times, a lot of times, you know, we get all emotional and stuff. We, you know, we're emotional people. Emotional. Yeah. emotional. And oftentimes we make decisions based upon how we feel. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, somebody make us mad, I don't like them. So I don't want to be bothered with them. Can I get an amen? How many of you know that, that everybody that God puts in your life, you ain't going to necessarily like? Sometimes people need to be put in your life to hold you accountable. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Because otherwise you wouldn't do right. No way. So sometimes God has to put somebody in your life that's going to hold you accountable. Tell you about yourself. Well, I ain't get no amens off that one, did I? That's why God put those people in your life. Amen. Amen. So everybody needs somebody to tell them when they're wrong. Can you say amen? All I need is God. God will speak right to that person you don't like. Can I get an amen? The very person you don't like. God ain't gonna put nobody in my life. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Amen. Now, now, you know, let's let's think about this here for a minute because you know when we talk about the heavenly realms and, and all this and the warring factions and all that kind of stuff, you know, Satan uses people, he influences people. And you know, if you are not spiritually minded. Now, first I've talked about walking in the spirit, but now I'm talking about being spiritually minded. Because there's a difference between being spiritually minded and being carnally minded. And of course, a natural minded person is a person who is unsaved. They are unregenerated, so they're going to be fleshly thinking anyway. But a carnally minded person is a person who has been saved, but they still think like a person who is not saved because their minds have not been renewed and they have not grown spiritually. Can you say amen? I mean, y'all see people like that all the time. They attend church, you know, they're spiritual while they're in church. You know, but as soon as they get out of church, walk off, the, walk, you don't even have to walk off the lot, the parking lot, just walk out the door of the church. And, and it'd be hot out there. And they allow them to say something that, you know, my God. <laughs> that they was thinking while they was in church. It's, <laughs> my God. And so when, when, you, when you are a carnal-minded Christian, you are playing right in the enemy's field. You're right on the 
level where he wants you to be. You're already walking in the flesh. But when you are fleshly thinking, when you're carnally thinking, and of course when a person thinks carnally all the time, what comes out of their mouth is going to be carnal. You, you wouldn't even know that person is saved. They don't talk no different than the folk who are unsaved. That's a corner-minded person. That's why Paul said that be not, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. So you have to be spiritually minded so that you can talk on a different level. Talk spiritually. Can I get an amen? Um, and you know, you have some preachers that teach you that, you know, some of y'all are too spiritual. Some of y'all are too spiritual. And I mean, you know, you be talking about, I'm uh, too blessed to be stressed and I'm and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. What you want me to say? You want me to say I'm cursed? You want me to cuss and go like you do? <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? You know, you need to speak words of faith so you can hear words of faith so that your faith can be built up so you can continue to walk in the spirit and not be walking in the flesh and thinking fleshly and carnally. Amen? Uh-huh, yeah. And, and so when, when we are spiritually minded, then we can recognize Satan's agenda. We can discern whether or not this is the agenda of God or this is the agenda of Satan. And when we're spiritually minded, we don't leave room for our emotions to get in the way to determine what kind of decisions we make. You understand what I'm saying? It's like I said, we are an emotional people. We love emotions. And if it feels good, if it feels all right, you know, make me feel good, then I'm all right with it. But sometimes God can use stuff that don't feel good to help you. Can I get an amen? So living in the heavenly, heavenly places means identifying with a spiritual worldview and participating in a divine frame of reference. And we need to learn to put the spiritual ahead of the physical because our real battle against a kingdom that seeks to influence and dominate us is spiritual. It's spiritual character of Satan's kingdom is deception. The character of his kingdom is deception. Anyone who hangs around the church knows what doctrine is. It's a system of teaching designed to instruct you. Bible doctrine is the teaching of what God's word says. When we learn Bible doctrine, we are engaging in God's system of truth. Did you know that Satan has a system of doctrine also? Did you know that? Write this verse down. 1 Timothy chapter 1, these two verses, chapter, uh, chapter 4, rather. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2. I want you to listen to what Paul said said in chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience, their own conscience, Seared with a hot iron. Yeah. Satan, demons, have doctrines. Isn't that interesting? Knowing what we know, Satan, 
It's not surprising that his system of doctrine is designed to mislead us. And after all, his kingdom is built on lies and deceit. And we're seeing a lot of his doctrine in our world today. Amen. And many people don't recognize it because demonic doctrines don't always come across as demonic. For example, people will say, out of concern for our children, we must hand out condoms. What we're really saying is, let's help our kids become more immoral. But they're not going to say that. That's how Satan is. He doesn't want the truth to come out. He wants to deceive and to trick people. Satan works hard to come up with doctrine that deceives. And he has some pretty good helpers on the earth. People known as false teachers who seek to deceive others by teaching Satan's lies as God's truth. Paul said in that second verse, that have been, they have been, their, their own conscience have been seared with a hot iron. That means that they have no feelings about what they're doing. There are plenty of people in our society who commit all kinds of sin without showing any kind of feelings. But Paul is not talking about wicked people in general, no. He's talking about people who mishandle the word of God while passing themselves off as Christian preachers and teachers. The doctrine of inclusion is one of them. The doctrine of inclusion. That's a doctrine of the demons. Demonic teaching. What is the doctrine of inclusion? That when Jesus came and he died for the sins of the whole world and his blood was shed, that means that everybody's sins are now forgiven and everybody going to heaven. Everybody. Everybody. That's the doctrine of inclusion. Everybody is saved. Everybody. Don't care what you do or who you are. You can be a Muslim. You can be a Buddhist. You can be an atheist. Jesus died. Now you say that's a, that's a demonic doctrine. Can I get an amen? amen. If that ain't bad enough. Here's another doctrine. The doctrine of super grace. The doctrine of super grace says that now that you are saved, that it don't matter what you do. You saved anyway. So you can, you can get saved, Brother God, Minister God. You can get saved. And you can live any kind of way you want to live. Grace got you covered. Can I get an amen? You can shack up. You can cheat on your wife. You can have as many wives as you want. Oh, grace got you covered. Can I get an amen? And, and they, what they preach and teach is, is that we're so sin conscious that we forget about the grace of God. And, and I want us to understand that the Bible teaches us, Bible teaches us that, you know, a uh, person who has been born of God, they can't continue on in sin. What, what does John mean by that? He means that you can't make sin a practice. Can I get an amen? And since you've been born of God, then sin cannot be a practice in your life. In other words, you practice sin daily and it don't bother you. If it don't bother you, that's a good indication you're not saved at all. Can I get an amen? amen. If you just sin, 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 and you know, that don't bother you, that's a good indication you don't know the law. You had not been born again. And, and John said, the reason for this is because the reason we can't go on sinning is because his seed remains in us. His seed, his seed. When the, a man comes together with his wife, he delivers seed. Can I get an amen? And that man's DNA is in that seed. His genes are in that seed. And the woman gives her egg and her genes. Her DNA is there. Well, when you got saved, Jesus said that the word of God is seed. Can I get an amen? And we become partakers of God's divine nature. And we are regenerated. We 
have the genes, the DNA of God, and because we have His seed remaining in us, we can't go on practicing sin. It's just uncomfortable. I gave the example on Wednesday night about this old guy who was a farmer. Can you say, man, had a had sheep and he had an old hog. Can I get an amen? amen. Had an old hog and little pet sheep. You know, kept his little pet sheep all nice and clean and uh, perfumed all up and everything. That little pet sheep. So one day the little pet sheep out in the yard and fell in the hog pen. Hog slop. He waddled and cried because he couldn't, he just couldn't stand being in the hog slop pen. It was just nasty. It just wasn't his nature. Can I get an amen? amen. Then he tried to make the old hog out of a pet. <laughs> Glory to God. And then got the hog and washed him up and cleaned him up real good. And uh, got him smelling all nice. And uh, that lasted for a few minutes. Hog went back outside. And uh, first place he went to was the hog slot the pen. And y'all know if you've ever been around a hog pen, all kind of stuff around a hog pen. Can I get an amen? It's nasty. He just went right on back to it. Why? Because that was his nature. Sheep are uncomfortable in sin. Oh, y'all listen to what I'm saying. They're not comfortable in it. And if you can be comfortable in sin, that's a good thing. Either, either you have not been born again or you have been in sin so long that your heart has become calloused. That you're no longer convicted by the Holy Ghost. Let me move on. Let me move on. i got to get to a close here. There are all kinds of people out there operating in the name of God and his word telling folk how to make a lot of money in God's name and other things that the Bible doesn't even teach. And the problem is people believe these heresies. And people are following doctrines of demons thinking that they're acting in God's name. And you have to know the word. You have to know the word of God for yourself to know the difference between uh -huh, Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. Because Satan's kingdom is built on deception because as Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44, the devil is the father of lies. Here's the next thing about Satan. The effects of Satan's kingdom is death. The effects of Satan's kingdom is death. Satan's kingdom is the kingdom of spiritual death. The subject of subjects of Satan's kingdom are walking dead people. People describe, or Paul rather described these people in this way. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what Paul writes. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Uh -huh. Paul said people who are outside of God are spiritually dead. Can I get an amen today? Uh -huh. How did they become spiritually dead? Because of Adam's sin. We've been dealing with that on Wednesday night. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death was passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5 and 12. It's because of Adam's sin that people are born in this world spiritually dead and separated from God. So Paul said in that first verse that at one time we were spiritually dead, but the Spirit of God has now quickened us. The word quickened means that he has made us alive unto God. When we were born again, we were quickened. We were made alive unto God. Amen? So, yeah, yeah. That, uh, so uh, 
Paul said to these people who are outside of God, they're spiritually dead now. That is, they are unable to respond to spiritual stimuli. Corpses don't listen to conversations in funeral homes. They have no appetite for food, and they feel no pain. They cannot function at all. And in the same way, people without God cannot function spiritually. The only difference between good sinners and bad sinners is the state of their decay and decomposition. The homeless man on Skid Row and the non-Christian CEO downtown are equally dead. One is dressed in a suit and tie, but they're both equally dead without the life of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Satan's kingdom not only produces the environment of spiritually dead people, it produces disobedient people. That's what Paul said in verse number two. Let me read it again. In which you once walked, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's talking about Satan. Yeah, the prince, the ruler of the authorities of the atmosphere. That's what that means. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. When men and women uh, begin operating on Satan's agenda, they set out on a course that brings them in direct conflict with the kingdom of God. And that's what Satan delights in. Of course, because he is not only the father of all lies, he is the original son of disobedience. The tragedy of people who are serving Satan's agenda is that they are under the judgment of God. They are living on borrowed time, and hell is their destiny. And this is all the reason we need to reach and snatch people from Satan's grasp. They are destined for eternal death without Christ. Have you ever gone into your kitchen at night and seen a roach? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Uh, I know y'all say, I don't have no roach. Huh? Okay, you had, at one time, I'm sure you did. You may not have none now, since you got hold of Terminex and, and all these other folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was your first inclination when you saw the roach? Uh, to kill that sucker. <laughs> you didn't stop and examine the roach and to see if it was a good roach or a bad roach. Or uh, maybe whether he deserved to live or die. You didn't care. A roach is a roach. An unclean creature that deserved to die. Period. Now, could I get an amen? Now, some of y'all wanted to kill it, but some of y'all ran. <laughs> I ain't just talking about women either. <laughs> I see folk run and scream behind the roach. <laughs> well, when God sees people functioning in the kingdom of Satan, they look like roaches. And some may be nice roaches. Some are roaches with perms. Some are Neiman Marcus roaches. Some are Walmart roaches. But it doesn't matter how nice they may look. All people living outside God's kingdom are marked for death. And we as believers can praise God that even though we were once destined for death as members of Satan's kingdom, God has saved us by his mercy. Can I get an amen? Yeah, saved us by his mercy. Write down the, uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians again in verses 4 and 5 and you go back and read that later. Everything Satan touches turns rotten and death is the inevitable product of his kingdom. Amen. So that's Satan's kingdom. It says everything about the devil is unalterably opposed to God. You can see why it's necessary that God establish the agenda of his kingdom for his people. Now let me close with this. Because what I want to share with you now, um, I want you to listen to me. Pay close attention. Because I want you to really, really think about what you're doing 
when you do what you do. Because we have done things a certain way for so long that we don't even think about what we're doing. We just do what we do. Can I get an amen? Because that's what we do and that's how we do it. Let me close with this. Because I want you to remember that Satan is an angel. Demons are angels. And angels are spirits. And in order for spirits to function legally in the earth realm, they need a body to cooperate with them. It doesn't matter if it's a human body or the body of an animal. Spirits need a physical body to function in the physical realm. Satan and his demons need bodies to do their work through, to promote his agenda. And Satan's agenda goes contrary to the agenda of God. As I showed us on last week, there is a gay agenda for America. And that is to overhaul, to change the attitude of Americans toward the LBGTQ community and to influence practically every area of the culture as possible. Same agenda is also evident in the political arena. People that we vote for to make laws and lead our country oftentimes go into politics with this ideology that they can make a difference only to get caught up in the agenda of Satan themselves. Democrats embrace and support the LBGTQ community and their agenda. Gay pride. While on the other hand, Republicans are pro-lifers as long as that life is still in the womb. But they are in bed with the NRA and defend the Second Amendment right. Yet every time there is a mass killing through gun violence in our schools or in some other public place, the only thing that they have to offer is their thoughts and prayers. Both of these parties are influenced by Satan and oftentimes we can't see it because we look at what we think are the good things that they do. Just like I shared with us, I, I don't know whether it was Wednesday night or last Sunday on how the pimp and the, that was last Sunday I think it was, the pimp and the drug pusher the pimp brings immorality into our community. And the drug pusher poisons our community. And we know that both of them are hurting our community. But on Thanksgiving, they bring turkeys. Can I get a name in here? So that makes up for all the bad stuff that they've done all year long. They give our turkeys to everybody. Everybody gonna get a turkey from old Slick Willie. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Slick Willie gonna have his his 18-wheeler parked in the parking lot close by the church. So he can show y'all the church don't do nothing for y'all. Slick Willie do though. So y'all can get on Facebook and talk about the church. We're trying to help you get saved. Yeah. And live a better life. Can I get an amen? amen? Whereas the pimp and the drug pusher is bringing immorality in the community and poisoning the community, and y'all don't say nothing about them. And whenever they cause death in the community, you keep your mouth closed on them. But won't talk about the church. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Oh, God. Mm hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I would never tell people not to vote. I would never tell you that because, you know, you have a constitutional right to vote. And every citizen of America should vote. But you really need to ask yourself, what are you supporting when you vote for any particular party? I believe that as believers, we should be involved in politics, but not 
the political system. What I mean by that is that people like Daniel and Nehemiah were both involved in the government and the political structures of their day. And yet neither of the men compromised their beliefs. Nor did Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't compromise their beliefs. They stood on what they believed and they held on to their values as Jews. Just because they were in a corrupt political system, they didn't allow the system of politics to corrupt them. You and I and all believers have to stand against the evil and wicked agenda of Satan and be about advancing God's kingdom agenda. The next time a politician has a meeting or a rally, and you can go there and ask questions, you ought to ask them about this stuff. What you going to do about this gay agenda? Y'all going to continue to have gay pride parties, celebrations? Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. That goes against my values. I don't believe in gay pride. Oh, I guess y'all do. Y'all ain't saying amen. amen. <laughs> y'all don't understand what I'm talking about in there? Do you, under, do you really understand what I'm talking about? Yes. You get a chance to go to one of Mr. Trump's rallies. Y'all go, they may kick you out of there. If you don't have a Blacks for Trump shirt on. <laughs> but ask him, what you going to do about all this gun violence? What you going to do about it? All these, let's see, let's see. When you ask that question about gun violence and about mass shootings in schools that's killing up white children, the first thing they're going to come to you is, what y'all doing about all the killings in Chicago? Black on black killings with guns. Well, that's why I'm here. Because I want to know if y'all going to create some laws for gun control. Because if y'all ain't going to change this gun thing, then I don't want to support you. You protect the unborn in the womb, but you don't protect people who are outside of the womb with gun control. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Because both of these sides, they, these are vital issues. They're vital issues. That people, particularly those of us who are supposed to be saved, we need to be looking at. Let's stand to our feet. I'm done. Anybody want to join the church? Come on down to the front. Come on down to the front. Come on down to the front. Had a young lady years ago. Years ago, we had lectures going on. We used to let people use our building. You know, during the election, young African American young lady, she um, she came to vote, and um, she asked me. She said, "Pastor, oh, I'm so confused." She's she's a Christian. She said, "I'm just so confused about you know what I should do about voting right now. I just don't know what to do." She said, "You know, I just can't go along with you know." Uh, Same-sex relationships and abortions and all that kind of stuff. I say, you know, uh, no, she said. Uh, and, and then, you know, the other agenda is that they are against that. They're against same-sex. And, and I, she said, as a Christian, you know, uh, that's, that's what I believe. I'm against it, too. I'm against abortion. I say, you know what? And, and this is <laughs> this is really interesting because 
when you talk about politics and all the issues and policies that these politicians make on both sides of the aisle, I told her, I say, now the ones who say that they are against same sex and they're against abortion, they say that because that's what their party believes in. I say, but now you let one of their daughters get pregnant by some young black boy. And they say that black women get more abortions than any other, that, that's what they say, than any other ethnic group in this nation. And the number one cause of death in America for African Americans is aborting the black babies. That's what they say. I say, but white women get more abortions than black women because black folks only make up 12% of the nation's population. White people are the majority of this population. And they go to their private doctors and get abortion, whereas black women have to go to these clinics playing parenthood and all that kind of stuff. And they're getting ready to shut those down so black women can't get abortion. And the next thing that's going to happen is going to be an old population of black kids. And that's going to create another problem for them because now they're outgrowing us. <laughs> Do y'all understand what I'm saying? It's politics. You got to pray and say, God, help me with this. Help me with this. Help me with this. Let's worship God today. If you want to join the church, come on down to the front. Come on down to the front.
to be with the Lord. Now, if you can't say that with confidence and assurance, then I want to give you an opportunity today to be saved and to know that you're saved. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 say that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and verse 9 say for by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not by works lest any man should boast. We're not saved because we're good people. We're not saved because we get it right all the time. We don't always get it right. We're not always as good as we should be. But God loved us, sent Jesus to die for us, and on the third day he raised him from the dead, and he has seated him at his own right hand. And if you're here this, this morning, or if you're watching on the live stream and you want to be saved, then I want to lead you in the word of prayer. I ask everyone, if you would, please, bow your heads. If you want to be saved, just repeat this prayer and just mean it with all of your heart and God will save you today. Just repeat after me. Dear God in heaven, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins and I turn away from them. And I turn my heart to you. I believe that Jesus is your son, that he died for all of my sins. And you raise him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would come into my life and save me. Guide me. Lead me. And teach me to live this same life. Right now, I receive you by faith as my Savior and my Lord. And I thank you, Jesus for saving me. I give my life to you. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing measures. Give me the ability to speak in other tongues and the power to bear witness of you. By faith, I receive the Holy Ghost. By faith, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. By faith, I have the tongues and I have the power. Thank you for filling me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, you meant it with all of your heart. God saved you from your sins. He filled you with his spirit and he's given you a brand new life in him, his very own life. The next thing you should do, if you're not already a member of a good Bible teaching church, I encourage you. Find a good Bible teaching church, unite with that church, become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then out of your obedience to him, be baptized. And if you live in 770-89-034-075, zip codes, you're close to this church, you're to come and join New Covenant. We're a great Bible teaching church, and we'd love to have you as a member. Amen? Let's give the Lord a hand clap today. You all can be seated if you need an offering envelope. Raise your hand with good one to the ASAP. Our scholarship fund envelope. Y'all sing just a little bit more. Now. Take my heart. Take my heart.